Hello, my name is Josiah. This is a live recording conversation between me and Mark Sargent recorded on March 6, 2024. We did it live on my YouTube channel. However, there was a lot of technical difficulties. And so this is the director's cut. I tried to keep as much of the conversation in it as possible. And I think Mark's only going to post the audio version of this. But if you want to watch the video, it's on my channel, Oil Swims on YouTube. So enjoy. Welcome to Oil Swims. Today I have the infamous Mark Sargent on the other side. Say hi, Mark. Hello. You hear me? <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So um, before we get started, a little introduction from Mark. We went at the uh, Flat Earth Meetup in Salt Lake City this weekend. It was awesome. And uh, if you were there, you know it was awesome. If you weren't there, you missed out. And I think that the, you're going to post some videos on your channel about it. Oh, already, already did. You already have. I right. did, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. If you don't know who Mark Sargent is, he is uh, he, he made the uh, uh, Flat Earth Clues nine years ago now? Nine years Holy ago uh, in February, nine years. Yeah. So you kind of came, you went flat 2014 or so. Um, I went, well, officially the, the clues went uh, online February of 2015. So, But I was looking into it in 2014, yeah. So crazy. It's been that long. Um, so yeah. basically, uh, Mark Sargent is the author, producer of Flat Earth Clues, which is, uh, you can listen to the whole audio book on your YouTube channel. Is it on Audible as well? I think. Uh, it's on Audible as well. You can, you can get that version if you want, but it's also in segments and in various bootlegs on YouTube and other platforms. So awesome. It's so good. If you haven't heard it, just listen to it. It's very convincing, and basically, uh, you ruined the life of someone who ruined my life. I'll get into that in a sec, but you were also in a, a silent producer in the Netflix documentary Behind the Curve, um, yep. <laughs> and uh, maybe you want to talk a bit about that in a sec, but you currently sure. host a podcast every week with Karen B. called Strange World, 7 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays, yep. and I listened to the one you posted last night. Oh part of it it's like three hours long all of them are pretty yeah. long but i yeah. love listening while i'm like working on stuff and whatnot so it's a good listen cool. it's entertaining yeah, well, thanks it's fun thanks it's fun we try we try to have fun <laughs> cool so like i said it's nice to so some of the, one of the people who had a big influence on my journey was rob skiba and yeah. i remember listening to a presentation that rob skiba did called the day mark Sargent ruined my life and so, like I said, it's nice to finally be talking to the person who ruined the life of someone who ruined my life. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, Rob, you know, uh, rest in peace, Rob Skiba. You know, his work will never be forgotten. And again, I highly recommend anybody from the biblical side, hopefully that site will never be torn down, called uh, testingtheglobe.com, uh, where he called me up, uh, you know, when we were working each with each other for different things in 2015 and 2016 where he said, yeah, I've gone through the Bible with a fine-tooth comb, and it's absolutely flat. He goes, except for one verse, and that's what every pastor is going to hang on to and you, and try to use it as veto power, which is Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 22, he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. He goes, but he goes, I could knock that out of the park all day because circle is not the same in Hebrew as ball or sphere or globe. Right. Um, and I love the fact that Rob, because you remember, he was, he was our veteran when we first started this out. He had been doing the public speaking tour for a number of years on biblical prophecy and all sorts of other stuff. And he had been working with Zen Garcia and those two had, had, had created a lot of content. So when he got into this, he wasn't sure if he would, if he wanted to go all out. So he told people that he was 98% flat whenever he was talking to people. And by the way, when he came up with that slide, that whole April 15th, 2015, the day Mark Sargent ruined my life, that was insurance. 
Don't think of it. Yeah, he was trying to be funny with it, but that was insurance because that way he could go on record and saying, if this thing goes south and Flat Earth just crashes and burns, I can point to that guy, Clark Sargent. <laughs> it's his saying, fault. Yeah, it was totally him. <laughs> he goes, I wasn't all the way in. It was it was partially his fault, and then he could back away. And it took him, oh, God, like another year and a half before he finally you know, said, all right, fine, I'm, I'm completely in. But he took a lot of hell. I know how he feels because, like... Uh, th- Cognitive dissonance is. I'm talk, just talk about this real quick. From all, as far as I can tell, this is how it works. It, initially, it's crazy, right? And then you realize, hey, the person you're talking to is not crazy. They're very reasonable, and everything's adding up, right? Everything's adding up. Right. It's cra- It's not crazy. So they're not crazy. They're just a liar, or they're a shill, or something like that. Right. And then you realize, hey, right. they're actually pointing out lies. So they're not a liar. And then it's like, am I going to continue to follow this line through this dissonance, through this fog to the other side? Because like you talk about in the Flat Earth Clues, if you take the red red pill, there's no going back. When you go flat, you never go back. Why? Because you have a new perspective and you can actually see what's actually on the other side. And you're like, oh, crap. Like, right. And and not just that, but and they talked about in the movie um, Behind the Curve, which was. Uh, the the reason we have a 99% retention rate, really the reason is that we didn't, like I didn't convince the person to tear down the globe. Right. They tore it down on their own. And that's some of the most effective uh, retention you could ever get, which is like, I didn't persuade you. You know, you tore the, you convinced yourself to tear down the globe. And once you tore it down, how are you going to, how are you going to put, put it back together? You know, if you have a change of heart, because you spent all that time, it's one of the greatest things of flat earth is once you, once you tear it down, you've destroyed it so completely that you couldn't go back even if you wanted to, which I know the comparison to the, the matrix is very, very obvious, which is once you're out of the matrix, if you remember the movie, that's now oh, 25 years old. Um, you, it's uh, that old now. It's crazy. Yeah, I know. It was 1999 where you you can't get back into it which is why cypher the the betrayer in that movie is like you know make me i don't want to remember anything which i would disagree it's like no no, no you want to remember this you want to go right. back and have some fun that's what i love about flat earth clues is when you you talk in the beginning you warn people you literally you're like if you keep tugging on this string like there's a 99 percent retention rate in this community yeah. and if you can yeah. get through that distance you keep pulling through that through that fog, through that brain fog, that dissonance, and you get to the other side, you can't go yeah. back. And it's yeah. a scary thing. So, yeah. Um, well, what I would like to do is, uh, um, if you're willing, yeah. I would like to get into, you know, some of the uh, story behind the curve. <laughs> if, oh, uh, you know, oh I see what you, you know did what there, I mean? behind yeah, the curve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So the origin of it was simple, which was uh, there was... This happens a lot in the world of Hollywood, which is you'll get people that work at a studio. So they've got their day jobs, but these wannabe directors and wannabe producers, they got to start somewhere. So they try to do their own projects. They scrape together some money and they try to do their own projects. Uh, And when you make something like that, you usually, you're not going to have a distributor. So you're going to have to make the film on your own and then eventually put it through the film festival circuit. There's a lot of film festivals all over the country and in in other countries. And so... They came up with this idea. I don't even remember what uh, you know what started it, other than they've told you know I've been told many many times uh, that I've been contacted because I, I put my real phone number and my email address out there, and I do. And people say, well, you know, why you get interviewed more than other people, or why you get to do things? It's like because people can find me. Media is lazy. All right, but right, like right. anybody else, well, you you, you inter- dox yourself in the uh, flat Earth clues, right? Ah, yeah, yeah, I dox myself in the Flat Earth Clues. I dox myself in the comments. Every description box of every video I've ever made uh, was uh, was basically a dox. It's like, oh, here's my, here's everything to know about. You can find me. You want to type in Mark's physical address, uh, his phone number, all that stuff. It's in there. Uh, and the first Strange World episode I did, uh, I doxed my criminal past. It was very obvious because they didn't want anyone coming back. It's like, oh my god, he used to make illegal fireworks in college. It's like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody it's a great did. story. <laughs> Just well, kidding. not like, yeah, not like but, you, <laughs> but not many people. Yeah, not many people had multiple federal raids. And I, you know, if this had been later down the road, I probably wouldn't be talking. So you got rocketry in your past, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. there was that. 
Um, so anyway, uh, so anyway, these guys called me, and uh, the director specifically, he goes, "Hey, can I fly up to Seattle and uh, you know, can I talk to you and see see what we're thinking of doing this?" I'm like, yeah, sure. And we met at a pizza parlor in Langley on Whidbey Island, and we talked for a little while, and I kind of gave him, you know, gave my little fireworks story. You know, just, again, full disclosure, because producers will ask you that. They'll say, are there any skeletons in your closet in case, you know, something happens? And he's like, you know what? I got a camera in the car right now. Let's let's shoot some test stuff. And almost, I mean, we shot a little bit in Langley, and then we did the beach shot, which was shortly after, and that was what they used for the opening of the movie. And that through that he's he, you know it kind of expanded which was like okay who can we get into this and i recommended some people you know i recommended bob and jaron and, and patricia uh and you know nathan thompson was kind of an odd you know little choice which they which they picked up on uh because you know he was so eccentric and then think yeah yeah sure why not um david weiss hadn't been fully up to speed yet so he he probably in hindsight was like glad he wasn't in it and of course, Chris Pontius, who made the models, which have been around. And between all those, it's like, oh yeah, we've, we've got pretty much our, our documentary structure laid out. And so for the next seven months, we shot off and on with different things. You know, I, they took me down to the, the 2017 eclipse, which was down in Oregon when it was going from Oregon all the way to South Carolina, diagonal um, from west to east. And uh, went to Patricia's. We shot there for a little bit down in Houston. Went to the Space Center. That was kind of fun. And I, I knew they were kind of making me out to be the protagonist of this. It's like, okay, we're going to carry Mark through the entire thing and then other people, as as some documentary things go, and then everybody's going to meet up at the big conference in Raleigh and it's going to be a lot of fun. And they missed some of the controversy. I'll give you a couple things. Uh, you know, the, the first conference, the conferences were supposed to be co-sponsored by Robbie Davidson and Brian Mullen from uh, Balls Out Physics, who was a structural engineer. And Brian Mullen was uh, ousted from the Flat Earth community, not because of us, but because structural engineers were angry that he would have anything to do with it. So they said, we'll have your license pulled if you actually host this conference. And so he, so Robbie Davidson took over from that point, for better or for worse. Um, then, you know, we, so we shot everything down at the conference. And here's what I didn't know. It was supposed to be really just a human interest piece. They weren't, uh, people, you can say what you want, but they weren't go scheduled to go against us. Right. Yes, they were going to interview a scientist. Yes, they were going to interview Scott Kelly, an astronaut. Yes, they were going to interview psychiatrists and crap like that and balance it out. But it wasn't, it was supposed to be kind of an open-ended thing like ancient aliens. And that changed when we got the conference and they never told us, which was when there was a 12-year-old kid that was asking me questions during the Q&A panel that I was doing. They thought that they was like, okay, what? Because you didn't notice there were kids running around here. They thought, okay, now we're influencing kids. You know, it's all fun and games until the kids are involved. So that's <laughs> until the when kids believe in the flat earth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, we're not going to take you seriously. Uh, oh, you're going to influence the the youth. Oh no, no, we can't have that. In fact, that's why they yelled at Kyrie Irving later. It's like there's a lot of kids that look up to you. It's true. Mm. So. The, the unfortunately for us they had already shot the movie and they had didn't have any money left to reshoot it so they edited it as best they could against us they went after bob with the hot mic they went after jaron with the, the the laser at the end uh, they went after nathan thompson made him look crazier than he was and then so they left patricia alone and, and chris Pontius they left alone but that's how they did and what you guys don't know also don't know about that movie is it is because it's an independent film with no distributors, again, you have to go to the film festival. So these guys didn't even think it was going to go anywhere. They thought, we're never even going to get into a film festival because, and they're, they're right in that the odds are stacked against them. Like the Toronto Film Festival, where we premiered, there were 3,000 film submissions. Most people don't know that 99% of the movies made out there you're never going to see in your life for various reasons. You know, they're just, they just don't make the cut. Mm -hmm. They don't resonate. And it's probably good that you didn't watch them because yeah. the cream usually rises to the top. And... Out of those 3,000 submissions, they only pick 100 to show up at the film festival. Now, those 100, there's only 10 that get to be considered standouts. We got into every film festival that we applied to. Wow. And we were always in the top 10, always. Now, we didn't win any awards, but it didn't really matter. Of course, why wouldn't you? I mean, come on. Back then, what, a flat earth independent film? It's never been done before. Right. It was a guarantee. It was a guarantee. Well, people, in and these I heard you say people thought that you guys were actors. Oh my God! Yeah, they were. Um, 
And and I didn't and I knew this because I sat in some of the film festivals yeah. that, that were in various parts of the country. You know, I, I, I came in and, and tried to hide myself so nobody recognized me. And what was happening was because because remember, Flat Earth was so alien to people that they were watching it. And for the first 20, 30 minutes of the film, they thought it was a fake movie. Yeah. They thought it was what's known as docufiction, where you're playing it like it's real, but everybody plays it, you know, it, it, a, do, a fake documentary movie. Right. And the, 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 the great story that the producers told me, because they had fun with this, you know, a lot of the independent filmmakers, they know each other. You know, it's kind of like garage bands. They all know each other yeah. until somebody breaks out and then you never see them again. Right. It's like somebody gets a major studio deal, and then it's like hey, everybody wants to be their friend, and nobody can reach them. So they they handed the movie off with no context, and nobody, somebody, one of the editors uh, that they knew that knew nothing, and he watched it, and they didn't give him any context, and he's going, "Wow, you guys have been holding out on me." It's like, "Why?" It's like, "Where did you get the money for this movie?" And he's like, "What are you talking about?" It's like, "Well, how much salary did you have to pay for all those damn actors?" Because they, they played it so straight. And they, they just dropped it on They go, no, man, there were no actors in this movie. It was absolutely real. And the guy just flipped out. He's going, whoa, whoa, that Raleigh conference, all those people, that was completely legit. And it's like, dude, we were there for three days. It was absolutely legit. And, you know, he just, you know, like dial, pupils dilated. He's like, what is happening? And that was the same effect with uh, all the studio audiences, which was, after about the 30 minute mark, everything, for whatever reason, I really should look into it more and see when the, the exact moment was. But I watched people around the audience, like, like nudge each other going, dude, I don't, I don't think this is, this is fake. I think these are, I think this is actually happening. And it, it was interesting, but also scared them because it's like, wait, there's something really weird on the internet and I know <laughs> nothing about it. And, yeah. you know, and, and especially like when they did the celebrity yeah. montage where all these celebrities were talking about it in one fashion or another. And they're like, what in the, you know? So yeah, they, they thought it was fake and I didn't blame, but well, it worked in our favor. It's so foreign. Yeah. Well, it got the word out that, that yeah, there's this and, thing, <laughs> there's this yeah. thing called and, flat earth and that people actually believe it. And you, the, like I said, the initial response is that's crazy. That was the, the angle they took like with Nathan Thompson, uh, you know, the guy that could juggle, you know, um, ping pong balls on, on hammers, that sort of thing, where he was so eccentric that they used him as kind of like the plucky comic relief release valve. That's uh, like, oh, okay, well, you know, this guy is obviously out there. But the rest of them, I mean, come on, Patricia came off really, really smooth. Uh, I thought I came off pretty good. Bob is an incredibly intelligent guy. Uh, Jaron came off good. Everybody came off good. And in fact, there was a little secret. I'll, I'll tell you, I don't t say this very often, where the producers had this guilty pleasure, you know, because they were at Chris Pontius's workshop for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And all the raw footage, you only saw like, what, 10, 15 minutes of it in the movie, if that. And they had hours and hours. And apparently, like during their lunch breaks, they would just sit and watch raw footage of Chris Pontius make these models. Huh. And they're just, just in tree. It was like watching um, Bob Ross paint. Yeah. You know, where, where, you know, you can watch Bob, right? And you're just sitting there just hypnotized, you know, and they were like eating their sandwiches, watching Chris Pontius. I thought that was very flattering. Um, as far as where I am in my journey though, uh, okay, let's just back up a few years before, uh, before the pandemic started, for example. Uh, in 2019, we couldn't do anything wrong. We were bulletproof. I mean, we had done conferences in seven countries. Uh, I was doing stuff all all over the place. It was so awesome. I mean, I opened up the Gather Festival in Stockholm. Uh, I did a I did a mobile commercial in Australia. I went to a festival in in New Zealand and stuff like that. And I mean, we were even close to uh, you know getting on the Amazing Race in uh for tw for the 2020 season you know that that reality television show oh yeah i heard about that that was just, yeah that. that's so crazy. yeah it was it was supposed to be nathan nathan thompson and matt long they were supposed to be in it uh, per my recommendations and and granted the the producers and i did not get along because i okay let, let me back up one thing when when a producer calls you and says oh hey we'd love you to be on the show can you watch season 31 you know, so you understand what we do. And I watch it and, uh, you know, like the, the great late Carrie Fisher said years ago, uh, <laughs> you go, she goes, she goes, you don't get it. She goes, if it's on television, it's not real. 
right? <laughs> yeah. there's, no, there's no reality there at all. I mean, it's completely staged. They make it look more real because they use generic people instead of professional actors. But it's, it's not real. And so when I was watching The Amazing Race, uh, I, I noticed it was all scripted. You know, I, I could see the plot holes all the, all, all the way down the line. And so I went back and went back to season one. And it's like, okay, has this been there since day freaking one? And it was. Season one was absolutely scripted. Uh, the Amazing Race is a, is a travel show disguised as a game show. Right. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> anyway, the, the point was we were doing so many fun, fun things. And then 2020 started. And we, I mean, we, we were set to do our conference in Vegas in 2020. And then the borders closed. And then everything changed to where everything went internal. So on, at one point, Yes, we could not do uh, meetups or events because everyone was requiring masks or restaurants were closed. Like Vegas wouldn't even let us do a conference unless everybody wore a mask. And you know full well that's, that's not going to fly. So, uh, so for three years, everything went internal to where we were just making content and sharing information and, and notes. And then finally, when the mandate started getting pulled back recently, that's when we kind of stretched out again. Now, Karen B., in her defense... She was going to do conferences no matter what. She's like, screw this. And she lucked out and she found a venue on the East Coast, a Shriners Hall, of all things. And uh, you know, people said, oh, wasn't that tied to the Masons? Like, yeah, it is. But you know what? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. If the Masons are willing to have us do conferences without a mask, we're, we're totally there. Yeah. So she did those nonstop. And then when it came around uh, last year to finally do the Vegas conference in, in 2023, she was on it. And she did a fantastic <clears> job. So, yeah, since that, I mean, you know, the short version of my nine-year journey, um, the documentary Behind the Curve was really fun. Uh, endorsements were kind of fun. Uh, three books on Amazon. I don't know how many meetups. I lost count of the interviews. Not as many as David Weiss, but still a lot. Uh, Do you think and, 2020 was the biggest year for the growth of the community? No, tw 2019. 2019? 2019. 20, 2020, everything just ground. Okay. Gr I mean, a lot of, I mean, you know part of that story where I literally was, uh, you know, I had my passports ready to do, and I granted I would have caught a lot of hell for this, but I've told people, it's like, look, if I can do a flat earth, I don't care what it is. And I was going to do a um, McDonald's commercial in London and we're up for pancake day because, you know, it's round and it's flat and they were hyping oh, it up. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. totally in. I'm totally going to do this. And then uh, I was supposed to leave in March of 2020. And then all of a sudden I get a phone call. It's like, oh, yeah, borders are closed. The, the, the project's done. And we don't even know if it's going to fire up back up anytime soon. So 2019 uh, was, wasn't a high watermark, but it was when we were running unchecked. You know, but, I mean, the first three years, for example, 2015 through 2018, we were shamelessly promoted by like YouTube you know, people forget that you know the difference between YouTube and Netflix is quality of content and they're still a big network you know big television and they make lifetimes worth of uh, content every year and you know no one's ever able to get through all the all the stuff but they were looking for a binge topic so they promoted us um, there's a wonderful documentary out there called uh, the social dilemma oh yeah I saw that. yeah it's that's before I yeah, before I believed that the earth was the way it is. I don't even know how it is, but I, I know it's not a certain way. But yeah, right. watching that, I was like, oh, yeah, flat earth. We need to censor that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I understood it where, you know, 2018, and I don't think it's a coincidence, where summer of 2018, when, I'm, when I was tracking the numbers, I was, I was always looking at the metrics uh, hmm. because it was like we were really – taking huge leaps and bounds to where the only people that were in front of us were major celebrities, you know, like Justin Bieber and Katy Perry and Taylor Swift. And, and one of them was Donald Trump. And I didn't think we'd catch him. Remember, he was president at the time. And I didn't think we'd catch him until uh, fall of 2018. And we caught him in the summer and w way earlier than I thought. And I made a video, it's, it's out there on, on my channel, called Flat Earth Catches the President of the United States. I thought I'd take a little jab. <laughs> and, and they were like, oh, can't have that. <laughs> you know, and shortly after that, yeah. they killed the scoreboard. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, there used to be a search results uh, line in YouTube where you typed in whatever topic it was, tractor maintenance. And it would say search results equals a number. I mean, it's, it's straight search engine 101. It's been there since a search engine has, has been invented decades ago. 
and they ripped it out of YouTube and they never put it back in for all topics forever. And it's like, what the hell? Are you kidding me? Do you think it's because of Flat Earth? Oh, it's absolutely because of Flat Earth. Because, I mean, shortly, shortly um, after that was that famous Senate hearing, which you can go out and look, where they were going to change some of the freedom or the the censorship issues on YouTube. So they yeah. banned three things. They banned false flags. You couldn't talk about you couldn't say that something where people died didn't happen. Uh, medical misinformation, which was going to come into play a couple of years later, go figure. You basically, you couldn't push snake oil, but medical misinformation was then expanded to say that you could not contradict the CDC or the WHO in any way. That was crazy. You you t- even now you cannot come out and say the cdc is wrong about this and then they also said and nobody can accuse the 2020 election of being fake those three things were banned from youtube now they have since because it's 2024 here we are four years later since um uh the the ele- it's now election year they are going they retracted that because 2024 there's so many people going to be reflecting on 2020 they didn't want to kick that many people off because the filters, the, the automated metrics would have, would, have, um, would have killed a lot of people. But the one thing they threw at the end wasn't something that was bad and said, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to recommend Flat Earth less. It's like, what? Why would you even say that? And on top of it, that's when the very first, and I'm sure you've seen it, wiki line was added under a video title, you know, category, which was us. So when you make a flat earth video, if you're viewing it, there'll be a wiki entry underneath it, which is basically their response. It's like, oh, hey, before you read comments or do anything else, click on this wiki entry and we'll give you our professional opinion of what that topic is. So what happened was uh, they they said they were going to recommend flat earth less. And by that, they meant they were going to monetize us less. And they weren't kidding. Uh, I remember specifically, we'll talk about Rob in a second here, where uh, I started getting fo- phone calls and messages from people. Like Jaron messaged me and said, you notice your monetization has been going down? Because we were actually doing pretty well. I mean, YouTube was, was paying us pretty well for what we were doing. And uh, and then Rob Skiba said the same thing. He's like, dude, I'm down like 70%. What's changed? And I go, we're not get, we're getting recommended in the sidebar. Um and, and this is tied to the French programmer. There was really one guy responsible for the algorithm of what is recommended for you. So on the sidebar where it says, we recommend these videos for you. There was one guy that was in charge of that. He was French. And they asked him, they said, so what is the deal? What, what, why, what, what determines what gets recommended for you? And I, 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 you couldn't have blown the, the smile off my face with a blowtorch. When he said what he did, because remember, there's thousands of topics on YouTube, thousands. Yeah. And he mentions one, and he says, "Well, if the average person that gets into flat Earth for the first time watches 20 videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend?" <laughs> and that's exactly, and that was exactly true, and that said it all, which was YouTube was looking for their binge-worthy series, and they found it. I mean, think of think yeah. of Netflix, for example, you know, just putting out programming and then all of a sudden something really takes off. Or, you know, no, we'll, we'll do one better. The Walking Dead for AMC. AMC had no confidence in that at all. It's like, well, it's not like it's going to be a huge hit, right? Our little network. And Walking Dead is still the spinoffs. They're still going yeah. years and years and years later. So um, they... Uh, that's what they did. They, they recommended us constantly to where people were complaining. After a while, it's like, why, no matter what topic, there was this wonderful video I put on my channel where uh, I recorded, you know, I grabbed this guy's video because every once in a while, someone will post something on YouTube where they'll say, hey, can you help me try to figure out how to change a carburetor out on a 53 Ford truck? Right. And then people respond to it. And this guy made a help video, which was how can I turn off recommendations for me? Because no matter what I say, no, I don't want to see it to he goes, it keeps popping up, and it's Flat Earth. No matter what I search for, Flat Earth just keeps showing up. And yeah, of course it was. YouTube, they knew their, their cash cow. We made them a lot of money for, for what we did. So for three years, they just put us out there. So I know, uh, you know a lot of our, our people, I mean, for me, I, I understood it. For other people, you know, they got kind of angry about it. You know, Jaron was crying censorship, and other people were saying, oh, they're censoring. He's like, no, the, if they were censoring us, they'd kill the channels. 
they 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 weren't hitting the brakes. They just took their foot off the gas. Right. And they thought, okay, well, maybe if we pay these guys less, because remember at that point we were already saturating the market. So uh, I mean, there's so much. I mean, come on, now there's so much content. No you, flat Earth channel has been killed, with the exception of, and we can bring this up if you want. The only the only channel I know that got taken down multiple times was Eric Dubé. Right. And that's because his political views, his his extracurricular stuff. Yeah, the World War Two and stuff stuff. Yeah, yeah. World yeah. War Two, you know, a guy with a mustache. It's like, dude, you can't <laughs> you can't intersplice that with flat earth, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and I've said this, I, I can say this, right? It's like, um, you know, you can't go flat earth, flat earth, flat earth. Adolf Hitler's the greatest guy ever. Flat earth, flat earth, flat earth, flat earth. <laughs> yeah. Right? And and it's not a subtle thing, right? It's like a four hour long video that you right. stick in there. About it. it's like okay, and you know, and then he wonders like he's like, oh, they're censoring me. It's like, what did you think was going to happen? But he's back. I mean, I think he's still got he's back and with like two hundred thousand followers. These people are never going to walk away from him, ever. Yeah, he's a, he's really interesting. He keeps, you know, he gets demon or he gets destroyed, and then he comes back, and he's like yeah. a freaking phoenix over and yeah, over. And, yeah, and and that's part of the mystique. Um, did you did you ever yeah. follow Owen Be- Owen Benjamin back in the day? No. No. Okay, so Owen Benjamin uh, used to be a mainstream comedian, and then finally he got out of Hollywood and said, Hollywood's really weird, man. I'm going to move to Idaho. So he did. Mm. And I remember he came up with this great comparison of Eric to like a Hollywood party. He goes, he goes, you know what his name is to me? It's Savanye. And that's a made-up <laughs> name, right? Savanye. Right, yeah. and it's like, and but you know who that is. He's he's the guy who's like in the back of the party, right? Who yeah, yeah, the back of the party about, guy. Oh, have you met Savanye? <laughs> yeah, have you met? And he apparently heard Eric DeBay's name so many times. It's like, dude, you really got to listen to Eric DeBay. Yeah, yeah. To where by the time he goes, I I he goes, I really hope I don't meet him because I'm sure it's going to be a huge letdown because he's been talked up so much. And and Eric really milked it. You know, I'm this yoga martial arts instructor from Thailand and. You know, very few people have ever met me in person. And, uh, I would whatever. love to meet him. I mean, I, I you know, I like so, a lot of his videos are actually really, really good. So, I, uh, no, the, the, yeah, the guy, you, the guy you want to meet, though, and I haven't, and I really wish I did. In in hindsight, was Matt Boylan, otherwise known as Math Powerland. Eric got a lot of intrigued people, but I never, and that's part of the movie. I never had so many producers mention Matt, Matt to me. To where the producers for Behind the Curve, for example, were just begging him to be reasonable and be in the movie without asking for demands, mm-hmm. right? And he just, he's so freaking out there. But he, well, you know, he, like all art artists. He was like the first one. So, he, like, you gotta be, in order for anything to take off, there has to be, like, one extremely eccentric person to, like, bring forth the energy, to it, yeah. you know, and, and I feel yeah. like he's that, that kind of... He, he was that guy, no question. I mean, that the reason why, and I took a little pride in it, which is why they, it, they used it in the movie, which was, look, I know Matt's story. I could, so well, I can tell it better than Matt. In fact, I can tell you the, the, the more truthful version of it, which was, did Matt work for NASA directly? Probably not. I mean, if anything, he may have made a couple images, but I think he made them as a subcontractor for a guy that worked at NASA, where Matt lucked out because, again, when when he was doing that whole thing, he was probably mid-20s, right? And he had also taken a stint in in Los Angeles. He's got an IMDb page. You can look him up. He's done bit parts uh, in Hollywood. Uh, Plus, he was a painter out of Montreal, Canada. I mean, good-looking guy. And what I think happened was, because I've seen him in video stuff do projects, I think this guy from NASA who had this summer cabin in the Hamptons said, hey, can you paint this living room wall? And Matt's like, oh, I can do, you know, the visionary. It's like, oh, I can do the most amazing thing on this wall. But he's not fast. So he was taking his time. You know, you can't rush an artist. And then at one point, the guy wanted to throw a party. And it's like, you know what? You'd probably be more interesting than any of the NASA people I'm going to invite. So why don't you come along? And then it unfolds. But again, because Matt was in his mode, he didn't get it. Yeah. Even though, I mean, you've, you've heard the story and I won't necessarily go off on what it was. But Well, you can tell it because after, it's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, you know. Oh, I, I yeah. can tell. I can, okay. Yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you the story. <laughs> so the story goes that this guy who worked for NASA through a high level 
I won't even call it an intellectual party. There was a lot of engineers there, but high brass, right? It's not like your average controller is going to be there. These are some higher up NASA mucky mucks. And since it's in the Hamptons, I can't remember if, I think it was a holiday party. Uh, you had some storms and the power goes out. Right. All right, fine. So you're down to candles and wine. That's always a good recipe for everything. I mean, that's basically just people telling stories at that point. And people are telling the stories and somebody was talking about Antarctica. And somebody just mentioned in passing, and of course we know so much more since then, was that uh, uh, they heard a the GPS doesn't work in Antarctica. And, and another guy says, hey, Frank, you should send some, uh, one of your teams down there to confirm that. I right? think you cut out right and, there. Uh, what doesn't work? Oh, uh, GPS, GPS. Doesn't, doesn't work in uh, Antarctica. So, uh, so one of the, guys, the high level guys says, uh, hey, Frank, if, if you have send one of your teams down there, you can um, you, you will figure this out. And then a guy way up on the food chain chimes in he goes well if he sends one of his teams that far they're not coming back and and matt you know being you know 20 25 year old ignorant you know it's like you know why do you mean wouldn't we wouldn't come back what is it too cold or something and the guy goes no it's flat right yeah. matt of course like anybody right you you don't even know how to process process that especially back in oh my god this story would have been he would have been it would have like been 2010 Something like maybe even earlier, maybe 2008. And so the guy then proceeds to get a piece of chalk from the owner and write on the granite floor, because it's a high-end Hampton house, just starts drawing out and talking about the world, drawing out the continents, drawing out the borders. He's talking about thermal systems and how energy transfers from one, one area to another. And, you know, and everyone like in the party is like nodding. It's like, yeah, yeah, like, like a bunch of people knew what the hell he was talking about. And at the end, Matt, and it would have been such a great thing to shoot for, for film. I mean, it would have been a brilliant scene when, when Matt said when he was done, when he was looking at some sort of elevated angle, he basically drew the UN flag. Yeah. And Matt still didn't get it. Because why would you? It doesn't make sense. I mean, come on, I've shown flat earth to people all the time and, you know, they don't think it's like, oh, it's like, wait a minute, that's a literal representation. It's like, yeah, most people, you, you might as well, you know, be talking about a ship to the ancient Indians back in the day. You know, the, the ones that couldn't couldn't even understand the ship in the harbor because they'd never seen one. It's like us, a weird alien craft landed, although we have more context now. Um, so, yeah, Matt, Matt processed it for like a couple of years. And then finally, it kicked on. You know, a light bulb went above his head. And he says, uh, uh, oh, my God. They, they were talking about it like it was literal. And then, always, you know, he starts making phone calls. He can't track down these people where they don't want, right. want to talk to him or whatever. And that started Matt's journey, which was, and, and we only even have this story. You know, Matt did, no, no offense to him, but he really only did one or two good videos. And the one video he did, which was an absolute standout, which they included a clip of it in the movie, was when his girl, current girlfriend in Montreal, when he was living there, just sat him down. I think it was like on a Saturday or Sunday morning, sober, smart girl, because he was drunk a lot. <laughs> you know, yeah. artist, the, 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 the artist that takes substances. Go figure. Yeah. Right. And <clears throat> she sat him down on the couch and turned the camera on. She never got in frame. And she goes, tell it. Tell the story. Right. And that and he couldn't have been more coherent. And it's like you could tell he wasn't acting. He he was he was just kind of he didn't like it that he was sober. I could tell. But it was in the morning. It's like, oh, I'll start drinking in a while, you know, but he, he told the story is very clear. And, uh, and it was and it had that spooky, tingly vibe to it. And it's like, yeah, there's more to this. There's something there's something here. And that in he wasn't even the first video that I'd seen, but that one got me curious enough to start digging into other things and then finally ended up doing my own research. Right. Uh, can you? Do you have a link to that video? Can you send it to me? I'll put it in the description of this video. I will see if I can find it, the original. <laughs> uh, that's I've never to seen but I, it, but I hear you talk about it, and I'm like, I've oh, never well, seen they, it. They use a short clip of it in... Um, in behind the curve. Okay. I, I know that they, when you see Matt on the couch, that's the video. Uh, I will see if I can find it though. I, I you know, I, I, I should be able to get it. And in case anyone's 
out there is wondering like what the UN flag look like looks like. It's what's the name of the map the uh, the equidistant map? Yeah, uh, yeah, the the AE map, otherwise known as the um, azimuthal equidistant. And it was made like a thousand Which, years ago, right? Yeah, a thousand years ago by a guy named uh, Al Biruni from the Middle East, and it's interesting because it's just technically a projection meaning <clears throat> it's the globe but in flat earth form that's what they tell you uh but what's interesting is is that it's it's an official projection and in in uh used by governments for various things however it's also identical to most of the flat earth maps that that are out there and so it's like okay one is being used by the government but one is crazy uh, and the, yeah. the AE map basically says that the North Pole, you basically take a globe and you squish it, to, uh, you know, from the North Pole down. And so the North Pole is the center of a dinner plate. The continents are splayed out around the outside edge organically, by the way. I, I think that's really, really cool. And then the whole thing is encircled by an Antar Antarctica. So Antarctica isn't this ice-covered continent at the, the bottom of the globe, about the same size of Australia, only with snow. It surrounds the entire thing. The only continent that doesn't make sense is Antarctica. Antarctica would be this giant uh, ring-like continent that encircles the whole place, unless there's openings somewhere. Mm -hmm. By the way, on, on that point, I want to bring this up because I don't get a chance to do this very often. I just remembered, which is if you want to look at do some weird stuff, look at the like Mercator map or even the Gauls Peter map, but definitely the Mercator map, the one that's in classrooms, you know, pulled down for the blackboard. And that is... In that map, remember, which should represent the globe because, you know, the North Pole's up here and the South Pole's down there. All the pointy bits point in one direction, meaning the, the you know, the, the for everything from the Baja of California to the boot of Italy, everything points down. And you're thinking, oh, that isn't so strange. It's like, really? Turn that map upside down and then take a look at it again. And then everything points up and it really, really looks alien. And what I mean by that is... It doesn't make sense. The odds are completely against it. You're telling me that no continents on the globe point down at, or at all? Nothing. Not a single piece of land. Uh, I mean, everything points down. Nothing points up. And But when you look at it on the AE map, everything points out organically, you know, in this in this lovely splay pattern. And it's like, yeah, that makes that makes more sense. It It's become very apparent to us over at least the last three, four years that they originally took the flat earth map and stretched it around the globe that's how they made it that's how they made the globe uh now did they have help from pff, an ancient civilization or the divine i don't know possibly somebody had to inspire them all right all right so I, I just want to ask you real quick because it's like okay so obviously when we're talking about the uh all the dynamics that happen within the terrarium of, of sorts that you were talking about with matt boylan talking to the uh nasa uh, executives right. and stuff they're describing how it all functions and stuff and um right. and it sounds crazy i mean I, I, this is the initial oh, sure. yeah this is the initial response that what people are going to have is like really flat earth is crazy like we know right. we know it's a globe right <laughs> we know right. that we right but 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 why do you know it's a globe you know exactly. I, I love using the quote from george orwell from 1946 where you know george or or orwell who wrote 1984 yep fairly influential book and he he was talking about the credibility of science and how people just believe whatever science tells them no matter what it is you know again we, we've shown it that's why i did the the uh the video called the code of credibility and and we've tested it ourselves it's like we you could go and try to hand out flyers in the in the corner of los angeles you know anywhere you wanted and people would just ignore you you put on a lab coat and hold a clipboard, people will walk up to you and talk to you without even nothing. They will find you. It's like, hey, man, what are you doing? What's up? You're a smart person. I want to talk to you. So I'm sorry. Where was it going with that? What was the thing? Um, uh, how, do you, how do people know this isn't crazy? So I, oh, what yeah, I would say a is. It's a goal. So yeah. wait, wait. George, so George Orwell, he, when he said, everybody believes science no matter what. So if you walk up to somebody in the sidewalk, and he said this, and you ask them, how do you know it's a globe? They all said what you just did, which was, it's a globe. Of course, we know it is a globe. And then he pushed it, and he goes, yeah, how do you know? And you got to remember, NASA wasn't even founded until 1958, right? 12 years later. So how did everybody walking around know in 1946 that it was a globe? There was no spaceships. There was no NASA. There was no nothing. Well, how did you know? You, had, you barely had radio. <laughs> a television wouldn't even happen for a while. How did you know? 
it's not that you know it's you were told your family your father was told his father and going back farther than your own family tree and that's when people start and he said that's when people start getting angry because they realize for a lot of the things in our world we believe we defer to higher authority. That person is smarter than me. He made an opinion. I'm going to believe that opinion because I'm either too lazy or I just, you know, I, I figure that I'm never going to attain his intellectual prowess. Therefore, I'm going to believe whatever it is. And that applies to all sorts of fun stuff. But with the, with the globe, yes, absolutely right. Which is why, of course, Flat Earth is crazy. Why? Because you've been told your whole life and everybody you've ever known has been told their whole life it's a globe. Right. It's been sitting in your classroom for at least 12 years until you graduated from high school. And that worked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's CIA pays top well, dollar for that sort of conditioning. The crazy thing about it, too, is that all observable evidence shows that everything's revolving around us. So like Edwin Hubble in 1927, he looked up to the sky and he said, oh, crap, everything looks like it. So that's where he came with the, up with the red shift, blue shift. Uh, thing or right. uh, we're like an ant on a balloon or whatever. You it, everything's expanding. Right. The problem with that is that the uh, the cosmological horizon, those stars that you know, because no new stars appear in our sky, they're just traveling far as fast now. They have to keep changing their story because of flat right. earthers. Right? Right. <laughs> if you've noticed that the narrative on space has changed a lot in the last few years, I think it's because of the flat earth movement. Because flat earthers oh, are like, yeah. wait, what about this? And they have to come up with an answer. Oh, now these yep. stars are traveling seven to eight times the speed of light. On the, on, it's like, what really? That's so crazy. Yeah. Because they have to and, be. They have to be traveling that far. Yeah, and no that parallax. Fast. That's a, the the average. The reason why they've been able to get away with it for so many years is the average person. Even though we've got wonderful technological, you know, advances. I mean, granted, the future was kind of robbed for us, but probably for a good reason. We don't have flying cars. We don't have rob robot servants. We don't have ray guns. However, I will say this: our our technological, our communication stuff. Oh, that's top notch. Oh yeah, I mean, that's stuff that even even the Jetsons couldn't come up with. But at the same time, uh, the average person, you know, if you go through high school, you get to remember, um, math club, really small, right? Uh, physics club, really small, and usually the same guys. Band, really big. And, you know, football, really big. You know, all sorts of groups are, are really, really big. The average person coming out of at least the American education system, not so smart. So when you're talking about things like redshift, blue shift, or, you know, lack of parallax, People don't even understand, like David Weiss has pointed out many, many times, the just the raw numbers from space absolutely blow over the head of most people. The fact that you know you have to measure the speed of light per second, because even if you take it up per minute, it becomes ridiculous and you know incomp. We have nothing to compare it to. But the parallax thing for anybody listening is, if you've got stars, and, and hopefully some of you know some of this, if the closest star is four light years away, but we have stuff that's 10,000 light years away or 100,000 light years away, then you should see parallax. So. Let's get into uh, a little bit. So like uh, flat earth clues, like that's nine years old now, right? Nine years. Yep. Yep. And uh, when that came out... Um, I didn't listen to it until like the last year, but when I listened to it, it's still incredibly relevant. And I was listening to it and I was like, wow, like I love how you warn people at the beginning, like don't do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, if you have a good life, if you, you know, because once you go on the <laughs> other side, you can't go back like 99% retention rate. Um, and then you get into yeah. all the clues. Uh, do you want to get into some of these clues you know, right now, do you have? Sure, I can. I can pull it up. Hang on, let me pull up the playlist really quick. Awesome. Um, the like I'm the story, the like right the now. story that uh, because you can watch NASA fails for hours and hours, like astronauts with harnesses and and wires right. and using uh, green screens, and you can watch that stuff forever. But the the first question that people always ask is, "But why? Why would they lie about space?" You know. And the, the, the biggest thing for me, and I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, thank you for, for bringing up the clues. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's always interesting for me to reflect on it because one, my message that really hasn't changed. I've tried to stay consistent, which is got to be some indication that I'm, I still have conviction for the original topic, yeah. which was because when I researched this, I researched it for nine months before I finally made the clues. And when I put him out again, it was a cry for help more than anything, which is like, okay, I think I've got, I think I've got it figured out. 
but I'm not positive. And I knew that the internet hive mind misses nothing, the hive mind. And so that's why I put, initially put all my, all my contact information because I wanted an academic. I wanted somebody with a master's or a PhD in a physical science or God forbid, you know, an astrophysicist to call me up and say, okay, here's why you're wrong and, and convince me that I'm wrong because I don't think I'm wrong anymore. You know, it, after nine months, I basically couldn't prove the globe in a court of law anymore. I mean, you know, if, if I was sitting down there for a jury, I couldn't do it. So how, what did, you know, did I make a mistake? And as far as the question you just asked, you know, why the lie, which is one of the bigger ones. Why, why lie about something like this? Why, why create NASA in 1958? <clears throat> why keep this thing a secret? And first off, let, let's get the obvious out of the way. We had nothing to do with the building of this place, which is a huge indicator of why lie. No different than the pyramids. If you've ever been out there, everyone's heard of the pyramids in, in Egypt, outside of Cairo, just outside of Cairo. I mean, there's a Starbucks within like a golf shot from that place now. But you'd never know because the angles, they make sure that the angles, there's nothing in front of the pyramids. But if you spun your camera around, it's just a freaking wall of, of city and commercialism and all this stuff. But they make it look, oh, look, these pyramids are in the middle of the desert. It's like, no, they're not. There's roads right. going right yeah. up to them with huge parking <clears throat> lots. Um. But but the but the point there was is we still to this day don't know who built the pyramids right uh, you know there's not a single hieroglyph saying who built them and uh, my theory and I really don't think it's theory it's exactly what human nature is I think somebody found them I think the pharaohs found them five thousand years ago in the middle of the desert and they're like there's no one around yeah we made these things yeah <laughs> yeah worship us and come on how powerful is that and that continued for long it's like how long did it take you 30 years well that's an awfully round number you want to tell us how you did it nope <laughs> and yeah. so they they just did it so imagine this so the point of it was like why hot why hide it it comes down to bad timing more and it sounds silly but let me explain we didn't even know. We didn't even have, again, remember, the, the stuff that we're talking, the high-tech stuff we're talking on right now, didn't even exist 30 years ago. Not even close, right? And if you go back 50 years ago, you st most of the planes were still flying, um, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of prop planes, not more prop props than jets. So we didn't even have the technological ability to explore everything until we created the internal combustion engine and then got pressurized aircraft which started out in the early 1900s but got better over time so when we figured this out best i can tell is around 1960 give or take right then the antarctic treaty was created in 1959 nasa was founded in 1958 but let's just round up to 19. You're saying that the governments discovered that the Earth was yeah. flat in 1960. So, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. If you're exploring, there's sections of the world. You remember back in 19, 1940s, 1950, that we still hadn't explored. Lots yeah. of them. And so if you, all of a sudden. Admiral so, Byrd. <laughs> Admiral Byrd, yeah. yeah. If you, The guy that went to the North Pole in 1926, if, which is why the clue of the Byrd Wall, which was the, the second one I did, which actually did very well. Uh, the people kind of understood. And that was just. That was just dumb luck, which was there was a CBS affiliate that had him on a show called the Long Jeans Chronoscope, which I mispronounced as Long Jeans Chronoscope because what the hell did I know? I didn't. I, apparently, they made watches. I didn't know how to pronounce it, whatever. So he was on that, and he was talking about Antarctica and the Operation Deep Freeze, which hadn't even been named yet, which he was going to go to in 1955, 56. And he was saying that uh, the whole place was made out of money. You know, there was a mountain range made out of coal, and, and I mean, he was oil. giving also give, you know, oil and, and minerals, and he, at one point he said, oh, and there's uranium, and the fact that he caught himself is a, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that, and it's like, oh my God, he didn't even have handlers back then, but the handlers, I'm sure, listened to it after a while, it's like, oh yeah, we can't keep this guy doing, he's, he's got, he, he's way too comfortable, and he lets things slip on camera. So they go down there for Operation Deep Freeze, and then all of a sudden, Antarctica, becomes off limits and the 13 countries that were down there just like couldn't get off the ice fast enough and then in 1959 the antarctic treaty was put into place and uh saying that no corporation from any country can set up shop mm. there ever and you remember it's <clears> 1959 <throat> they said it's not even up for uh review until 2040 it's like well, that's 80 freaking years it's like what, what treaty has is, is that rock solid it's the longest like, standing treaty on, on, it's the on only the unbroken treaty. yeah in the in the histories of guarding history penguins, of <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and weird. It's it, a military. And not only you, the the part it wasn't that the treaty was built; 
It's that you weren't even allowed to discuss the trading. Yeah, yeah. That's the part that that a lot of people don't know that that was my tipping point. For most people, it's long distance photography or it's vacuum of space or it's NASA something. No, for me, it was the Antarctic Treaty because come on, especially in America, right? You know, our 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 empire is built off greed and power and money. Right? We've done a lot of bad things right, to yeah. create our empire, and yet that same empire isn't allowed to, or England or any of our allies, isn't even allowed to talk about Antarctica. I mean, yeah. when, there are no articles saying, oh, Britain challenges the treaty. China, when you become an economic power, something is put, you know, this this paper is put in front of you saying, yeah, you're, you're not going to Antarctica. It's like, why? It doesn't matter. National security, shut up, sign it. <laughs> and they yeah. do, right? And then they never, that never changes. Well, it was signed, so, was it 1959 it was signed, but the space programs were founded in 1958? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coincidentally. Which, again, wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> and I really love the fact that Rob Skiba picked up on that. He was the first one to really jump on it, which was NASA's founded in 1958. And then in 1959, we do high altitude atomic weapons. Doesn't matter if you believe in atomic weapons or not. The tests were still from something. And Russia and the United States are firing straight up. Yeah. All the tests for four years. Dominique, four years? right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fishbowl, yeah. well, Dominic. Fishbowl. Uh, yeah. All the aerial stuff was firing up. And I knew exactly what it was. That is the typical guy thing, which is like, oh, there's a wall. Get the cannon. Let's see if we can bust through this thing. You know, what do we have? You know, what's a bigger cannon? And they just kept upping the stakes and up. The, and for three years, they tried. Three, three, four. It doesn't really matter because Russia and the United States quit on exactly the same day. But during that time, they... Um, they founded NASA, and then they announced the the two things were really the the glaring ones. They announced the Van Allen radiation belts in 1959, and said that oh yeah, it's super deadly up there. No one should ever ever go up there. And then they sealed off Antarctica in 1959. They exactly what I would do, which was you know I tried to if I can't improve on a particular conspiracy, I think it's real. I I, I consider myself pretty clever that way, which was okay. So you seal off the outer marker and the upper marker same year. And this, but to your question, why do it? And that is because they were afraid. Why? Why keep it secret? Because they were afraid of what the population might do. By 1960, everything was pretty much what they wanted. World War II was long over. The United States was surging. I mean, we were the Camelot beacon on the you know shining on the hill. We could do no wrong. And I talked about this recently, where I said they went for broke which was they, they, they killed two birds with one stone. They said, look, everybody believes everything America says in the 1960s. Every, we did. We could not do any wrong. And so they said, let's do what the Roman Empire couldn't. Let's say we went to the moon. Right? Which is, yeah. are we going to the moon? Doesn't matter. We're just going to tell people we went to the moon. Can we fake it? Yeah, we can fake it. It'll be totally fine. And so they did. And they, you know, they said we went to the moon multiple times. We we're the only ones to even attempt it, by the way, even now, you know, kicking the can down the road decades later. And, and again, they did it between that and the Antarctic Treaty and everything else. They sealed off the world because they were afraid of what the population might do. Meaning, uh, you think, oh, well, if the people knew it wouldn't be too big a or that big a deal. It's like, yeah, 1960 would have. <laughs> Meaning, um, don't, don't forget that 13 years earlier was Roswell. And Roswell was a nightmare publicly i mean people were freaking out if you look up the newspaper headlines from what yeah, happened yeah. and they released that story out there the death the star and it took the pentagon days <laughs> to find out and they has like oh no we're retracting this weather balloon everybody weather balloon you yeah you're the patsy weather balloon shut up yeah <laughs> and so that's what they did so 1960 it's like i mean that and that was just a stupid little ufo which i think was real lovely tv movie by the way called roswell with uh, kyle mclaughlin from the early dune yeah, yeah. And so with this, it was like, do you really think, and I, I've asked journalists, it's like, really, you're going to release that story that the earth is a snow globe? You're really going to do that in 1960? They weren't ready. Not even close yeah. to, to tell the general public. So they didn't. And they, and again, because we didn't do it, all they had to do was keep the secret, right? All they had to do was keep Antarctica locked down, which works out for the most part, because it's a horrible place to go to, and then <laughs> militarize space, which they did for a long time. There were no private space companies. For a long time. And then when the private space companies did come online, which were completely infiltrated by ex-NASA employees or current NASA employees, they made sure they were crashing on a regular basis. Blue Horizon, you know, Google, you know, uh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah, the last you three know, have Elon couldn't tipped over, right? Up stuff. He just blew something recently. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, I was doing a, um, a London interview 
And it was one of the only times I was ever intimidated, uh, which was a journalist named uh, Piers Morgan over in London. And I thought for sure he was going to eat me alive because he destroys politicians on a regular basis. And I asked him, I go, really, would you drop that story? And he couldn't bring himself to do it. So what happened was, imagine this. Let's say you're at an Illuminati meeting. You know, it's a big, long table, very badly lit. Everybody's smoking for some reason. I don't know why the evil, sinister people all smoke. Uh, you would think the tobacco industry would have something against that. Anyway, somebody says, well, okay, what could go wrong? Let's say in 1960, what would be so wrong if we told the general public? One is that uh, the um, academics would be completely screwed up, meaning every university in every country would have to retool science, starting literally from the ground up, no play on words there. Meaning uh, astrophysics and astronomy, that would have to be gutted. And you don't even know what to do. You don't even know those two are coming back. And then you have like geology and hydrology and uh, archaeology. Anything with an ology has to be rebuilt because you have to rebuild the world model around it. Libraries would have to be emptied and then brought back, you know, and then refilled. And that that's not going to happen. So, you know, that, that academically alone, and remember, that's every university in every country, and there's a lot of them out there. Just think of the American schools. Then you have economically, which is uh, economically the, the world markets. So the world markets, as you guys know, are super, super twitchy, even though the stock markets right now in America are, are propped up to no end. Those would have to shut down before you even made those announcements or make the announcement right after you, you uh, or shut down right after you make the announcements because you don't know what, what it means. There are certain industries that would collapse, certain industries that would thrive. There would people that would be relocating to different parts of the world based on what you were doing. And last but not least, you have the religious side of things. And that's really the biggest one when it comes down to it. You know, the five religious houses of the world. And you guys know these, which is um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So you give those five religious houses leverage against science, and you're asking them to show restraint, right? These same religious houses that had to renounce the, the original snow globe model some centuries earlier. And not only that, but science has been building their foundations and beating people over the head with textbooks for the last five centuries. And you're asking him to, to not take revenge. That's an impossible task. Every church would say this. I don't care what church it is. But say, okay, so you were wrong about something really, really big and important. What else were you wrong about? Let's revisit it, shall we? I don't know. Carbon dating, evolution, the Big Bang, dark matter, quantum mechanics. Everything that you can think of that they've been laying down for a long time. You know, hammering religion on its way. Uh, that yeah, the religions wouldn't stop. And so science, again, is will do, for the most part, anything it can to protect itself, like anybody else. So the institution has to stay alive. All right, with that, we are going to go to an intermission, I think. And I'm going to get a new link. And then when we come back, we'll get a few more questions and then go from there. This has been Oil Swims Live, and I'm your new host, Mark Sargent. <laughs> We're back. Okay, my Maybe. mic was muted just there, so I just said it's hard to produce our own show and uh, produce my own show and, and do the interview at the same time, and you have a producer. His name's Peanut, is that correct? Peanut Gallery, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you were in the middle of telling the story about, you know, the Operation Dominique, High Jump. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, the, the Atomic Weapons Program for example, which the Americans were, were doing was, was something that we instinctually would have done. The military is very ham-fisted, which is if they see a barrier they want to get through, that's what they're going to try to. Wouldn't you? I mean, it's there's an argument I used years ago. Um, in fact, I put it in the clues, which was the wildlife preserve example, which is humans are very different compared to every other animal life form. You could put a hundred buffalo in a thousand acre wild preserve with with grass and water and fresh air and then and and put a fence around it and they'd be perfectly fine they're not going to care just walk through the fence like hey there's a fence and they turn around and they're going to go back and eat their grass right 
You put a dozen people in that same thousand acre wildlife reserve, even though there's more than enough room for everybody to do whatever they want, they're only going to care about one thing, which is the wall. We are eternally curious about that. It's mysterious. Human beings love a mystery. And they walk up to the fence like, why is this fence here? Why are we on this side of the fence? What's on the other side of the fence? Uh, who built the fence? And have we angered the fence gods? Uh, and it's like, you know, what sh what shall we do? Shall we sacrifice things to the fence gods? Let's grab some of those buffalo. And then it just spirals from, from there. That people, it's like, okay, when the world was turned from flat to a globe, if you're wondering why, that's the big reason why. You can't leave it a snow globe forever because as the technology increases, people will start looking for the edge. Like any, any other animal, they'll at least probe it. Well, with our other mammals, animals don't care when they finally get there. We'd care. We'd be obsessed about it. So, um, and what, so when what? So imagine this. Again, you could go into Google and type in ancient cosmology and click on images. You're only going to see one yeah. image, which is basically all these cultures drew the same thing. They drew an enclosed world. Yeah, yeah. All of them. And when they wrapped it around a globe, the genius of this plan was they made it seem because it was spherical, that there was nowhere to go. There was no edge to go to. You could just do laps around it all day long like an ant on an orange. You're never going to find the edge because it's spherical. And again, because Antarctica is so hostile, it just screams go away. That's where they also lucked out, which was the outer rim of this place, which is so incredibly cold that ships, and by the way, the, every captain will tell you, oh yeah, icebergs are the scariest thing ever. Right, and then you get to the Antarctic coastline, which is ice and snow, and more ice and more snow, and the whole thing. I mean, most of it's a plateau at like fourteen thousand feet, which is twice the amount of the average person for altitude sickness. And then there's no animal life and no plant life. I mean, this place just screams go away, which would be a, again part of the brilliance of the design of this place is that. Whoever made it, it wasn't us, right? If it was an advanced civilization, it was God, didn't have to put up a big sign with skull and crossbones saying, go away, right? Didn't have to put frost giants holding huge axes. And now your voice, I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> so just so you know, the host is having some audio problems. He's going to be typing to me. However, uh, his voice kicked out for some reason. So again, the design, here, here's why that makes Antarctica go so well it antarctica is so hostile that it makes it seem like it was your decision to turn back so if the icebergs didn't make you turn back the 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 ice wall you know the the 150 foot wall of snow would have made you turn back or when you got up there you realize there was no food or plant life so you also realize it's like oh crap it's like you know it's like if whatever supplies they're gonna keep us alive that's all we've got because we have nothing to eat unless you really think you're going to hunt down all the penguins. And even if you ate those, I don't think they're, I mean, they're probably pretty greasy. So what that means is eventually when you're done suffering on the ice, you're going to turn back and you'll think, well, it was my decision. You weren't forced away. Human beings hate that. If there was a big giant golden door with padlocks on it, we just keep trying. We just keep trying for the door. But there is no door. There is no wall. There's nothing to go to, which is why Admiral Byrd, and the United States Navy tried for 30 years to find some sort of outer marker. That's all they cared about when they were out there. They're just flying around, flying around. And then, you know, they're not going to tell you, but it's pretty much what I think it is. They found the outer marker, some indication that there was some sort of edge to this place, some barrier. We call it the snow globe wall, whatever. And as soon as they found that, they realized the implications of it, which was, yeah, we can't let people down here. We can't let independent explorers, we can't let other countries, especially now that we have oil and gas companies, because you're probably thinking, well, if there's oil, think of this real quick, which is the United States, especially we can, and we've all heard the stories. There's been movies and documentaries made up for years, which is if the oil and gas company wants to start to start fracking in your neighborhood tomorrow, they can make it happen. It's real easy. It's just money. And they've done it a lot. They've Every place they could frack in the United States, they've pretty much done at this point. Yeah. However, those same companies with unlimited amounts of financial resources, not only are they not setting up shop in Antarctica, which you know they would, but they're not even allowed to talk about it. 
Not even allowed to, I mean, come on, British Petroleum, after the war, they needed the resources. Europe was rebuilding. And yet that company didn't run full page ads in the London Times saying how great it would be for British Petroleum to go down to Antarctica. And I know exactly why. It just made one phone call to the head of whatever oil company it was. It's like, yeah, national security. You can't go down. The fact, all you have to do is contact the British government and have them contact British Petroleum and be like, national security, God and country, you can't go down there. And when you retire... You hand our business card over to someone else. And if you don't, that's okay. We're going to come visit them anyway. You don't get to go down there. And you can make up any reason you want. And that, that is an easy way to keep Antarctica off limits. The, the, keeping the outer marker or the um, space, militarizing space, that's a little tougher. Because eventually the tech's going to keep ramping up and ramping up and ramping up. And eventually some of these companies, which remember, NASA is just a collection of parts. Right. So NASA's, you know, NASA doesn't make their own parts. They get it from McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and General Dynamics and guys like that. Lockheed Martin. And what you don't want is those companies going off on their own and doing their own thing. Because, you know, they could team up with any sort of commercial thing. I mean, Lockheed Martin could team up with Doritos, you know, Frito-Lay and, and start shooting rockets. Well, you don't want that because those rockets aren't going anywhere. They're going to crash. And so you suppress as much as you can, sabotage as many rockets as you can. Well, you think that Artemis won that fireworks display? You think that was an accident? Really? <laughs> no. And then Artemis won again, you know, trying to go around the moon, low res footage and Well, they're nothing. afraid they're Gives afraid nothing. of us. By the way, no stars. They're ever. afraid that we're going to yeah. critique their missions. Not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Not going to happen ever. Yeah, All right. Crazy. So the host is going to be typing me something. Yeah, he's never going to be able to solve this audio issue. <laughs> it's okay. We, we've already got a lot in the can anyway, man. We could, I can totally splice this into something. I'm sure you could too. But you got any, got any final questions for me? They can hear me though. Who can hear you? The, the, the audience? Okay, well then yeah, type, type a question. I'll give you another 15. <laughs> type a question. All right. To, to the thing. What questions do you have? Maybe from chat. I'll see if I can do them rapid fire. If you have any questions from chat, this is, by the way, very unusual because it's weird that they can hear you. Last few space launches. Oh, okay, yeah, let's go into that really quick. So, three things again. A couple things you have to look at. One is is that no one has even tried to make a human landing on the moon since the Americans in 1972. There's supposedly, what, five launch-capable countries or organizations out there right now? Japan, Russia, China, the European Agency, and us. Well, now India, right? We'll, we'll throw in India. So six. No one's even tried to do humans. No one's even attempted it. And honestly, the Americans shouldn't have done it either because think how, how horrible that would be. Let's say, for example, one of the Apollo missions crashes, right, and people die. Well, then you've turned the moon into a giant headstone. Right. That just screams, which is why you'd never, ever want to do this for real. It'd just be too, too damn dangerous. But as far as the last three, for example, so the first one was, um, which was back at least five, six months ago, five months ago, we'll say, was India. They said, oh, we landed a probe on the moon for the cost of like $75 million, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, you can't even buy half of a super yacht for $75 million. And that's just a boat. And yet they use 1994 computer graphics. And, uh, okay, uh, that, yeah, I'll do that one. Uh, 1994 computer graphics, and then, you know, to do touchdown, there were no images from the moon for India, and it was just absolutely, and yet the, everyone was cheering when they showed this little computer graphic thing land on the moon, which was some of the worst graphics I've ever seen. I was in the gaming industry. Um, the second one was Japan. They tried to land a probe on the moon, and it crashed. Not hard enough to destroy it, okay. And then it tipped over, and then uh, uh, they released their little, their little ball probe, and in its last dying moments, it took a single shot of the probe and the sky behind it and beamed it back a quarter million mil miles to, to Earth. With, with what technology? With what power source? What, what, how did you even remotely do this? How? Uh, and then Odysseus, which was an American probe, which was NASA is going to take partial credit for, they crash as well. Then it tips over supposedly, and didn't release a probe, and then took two shots, and yet, even though the telemetry was completely wrong, and they don't have the power to do it, again, power source to transmit HD video a quarter million miles. No, never, no way, no how. And, sorry, the short answer before we get to where we live, which is, here's the big problem for them. 
with Artemis and everything moving forward. You're saying, why have they kicked this down the road for 50-something years? And they just keep kicking the can down the road. Artemis 2 isn't going to launch now until at least September of 25. I can guarantee you it's not going to launch September of 25. And the reason is, is because the internet and social media is too bored and too good at what they do. They microscope everything. I have said for years, if you tried to fake the space program, right? If you came to me with a dump truck full of $100 bills, Hey, I just heard you. Yeah. Did you find out what it was? Everyone can hear me now. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. So if you if you backed up with a dump truck full of money and said, hey, Mark, you know, pretend I'm a director and say, can you fake the moon mission for us? Kind of like Stanley Kubrick back in the day. Even though it was a trillion dollars, I'd be like, no, no, you absolutely, I, there's no way. And the reason why is production mistakes, the bigger the operation the more production mistakes you are going to miss. And I'll use this before we get to the, the where do we live thing, which is think about this. Lord of the Rings, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, famous movie, one you know, eventually won, won Best Picture. Big production, really, really big production, right? Yeah. Went yeah. through primary shooting, editing, the dailies, post-editing, special effects, right? The, the same pieces of film were th it went through m so many people's hands, right? Including the premiere. Right. Released in theaters and the first theatrical cut, when the hobbits are leaving the Shire, there's a road in the upper right-hand corner of the screen and a white car driving through it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you got to remember, and, and the reason was power of, of, that was misdirection. Everybody's focused on the hobbits. Everyone's looking to the bottom left, bottom left, bottom left. Some guy in his popcorn drops a piece of popcorn. He looks up just because he's looking at the wrong player. It's like, hey, what's that doing there? Phone calls are made. Next thing you know, they have to recut the film and redistribute all the roles because of that one little mistake. Why is that relevant? If you tried to fake, and I know think tanks are going to listen to some of this. They listen to us a lot, a lot more than you might think. It's not delusions of grandeur. But you've, you've heard me say this a lot, which is if you try to fake a human moon mission now, and it's not flawless. You are busted in a matter of hours. I mean, completely busted everywhere because whatever's on the internet, it sticks. Good luck purging it from anywhere. You would have to, you couldn't do anything live, which meant the whole thing would be fake. Um, your pre records would have to be flawless. And all it takes is one guy to screw up one little thing. And we have seen these, I mean, the, their track record just on the ISS alone is abysmal. I mean, the hairspray alone is horrible <laughs> not to mention the layering glitches the harness glitches the gravity glitches uh just the general cgi glitches there, i mean tons and tons and tons of mistakes the astronaut and, who almost drowned <laughs> yeah yeah the uh, yeah it, the fact that you're training in an underwater pool right which yeah. is and it's like why do you train oh because it gives us that floaty feeling i'm just going yeah but that's the exact opposite of what you should be doing you should be training in a vacuum chamber but we can't because the vacuum chamber would prove that spacesuits don't work spacesuit right. a soft spacesuit cannot work in a vacuum exactly. chamber exactly that's the craziest thing like you put a you put us an astronaut in a spacesuit in a vacuum chamber it would not yeah. hold up no there's no way anything uh, you guys and you Every object, you can look this up on YouTube all day long or whatever platform you want. Anything, because people, you know, science geeks have done this for years. You put anything in a vacuum chamber, it will detonate. That's a soccer ball, football, basketball, a can of soda. Uh, and that's metal, by the way. All sorts of things. They just eventually expand and blow up. There's only one thing I have ever seen that has not expanded in a vacuum. Astronaut suit astronaut suit <laughs> and and even though i have asked a scientist for years i said explain it to me explain it to me and the reason and then no one i get crickets the reason why i know it's absolutely fake is because i can't even come up with a fictional way of making that space at work meaning the uh, i the carbon remember, I where would the carbon dioxide go where does it oh dude, dude. <laughs> What, what remember this is a, this is not tethered to anything it's a magic backpack and even if you could tell me there was some microprocessor technology that you could counteract the vacuum which you can't but tell me what you did in 1969 when everything was analog right. <laughs> and and your battery power was terrible and yeah. sorry one more thing really fast before we get to the where we live thing you want to look this up and again I'd love for a troll to send me this if you know any scuba divers 
I've, I've said this many times, which is scuba divers are notorious for one thing. They're always checking their air levels, always, because that's the only thing that matters. You're down there, you're checking that giant gauge that you're either holding or it's hanging off your wrist. And it's like, how many how many minutes of air left do I have, you know, doing? You know what you never heard from the Apollo astronauts? You never heard them talk about how much air they had left, ever, ever. And you're saying, well, they had carbon scrubbers. It's like, really? Car you know, they had carbon scrubbers because uh, in submarines, carbon scrubbers are the sides of this room. Right. Right. And it, they take immense amount of power. Right? So it's like, okay, so you're telling me that in a backpack you had carbon scrubbers. And if you could, then we'd have infant scuba technology. It would, <laughs> it would have filtered down to the civilian market. Not to mention, by the way, that what we're breathing in is 80% oxygen. There's two tanks on the back of scuba divers, one for nitrogen, one for oxygen. Where'd all the nitrogen go? Right. When we, you know, how'd you get all the nitrogen up there? And then how did you depressurize? And oh my God, it's just never again because the average Plus, person. You can see the bubbles in the space. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of those yeah. clips. They, it's crazy. That was genius. Which yeah, was yeah. let's create let's create a replica of the ISS underwater, mm -hmm. and then we'll just turn all the lights off, and then we can put green screens where we want. And I mean that's that's movie technology, and we've been doing that for years. I'm going to blame James Cameron for some of that. He was one of the early guys that figured out you could do incredible underwater she uh, scenes by just. In fact, he didn't even have a place that you could turn off the lights. He filled the top layer with um, uh, layers of rubber, small rubber balls, and it blocked out all the light. That's how they shot the abyss. The abyss looks like deep water, yeah. and it's not. It's just a freaking swimming pool. It's not very deep at all. Yeah. If you ever, you've never seen it. 1989, the abyss. I highly recommend. And if you don't think they can fake the ISS, I mean, you can watch like The Big Bang Theory did it. There's oh yeah, oh, the actors. yeah not, not, and that's just a television show. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, really good special effects like gravity. What can you do with seventy million dollars a day? You know, and he, right. they even still suck. Like some of these videos that NASA releases, you're like, seriously? Like that yeah. is so crappy. Because I think the reason why is because if they release something super good, then you can critique it. But if it's blurry, you know, then you can't. Right. That's right. And and they made a mistake, which was unfortunately because they're like with any Hollywood movie, there is a continuity issue. Whatever you shot in 1969, it has to match yes. up with it. And yeah. so how they are getting away, by the way, lately with no stars in space, by the way, Artemis never showed any stars. Uh, the, the probes, Japan, India, uh, Odysseus never showed any stars. So, again, trolls, if you're listening out there, why are there no stars in space now? You want to say, and I give you a pass on this, you want to say in 1969 it was because of exposure settings because they used film. Okay, that's fine. We don't use film anymore. It's all digital. Our cameras can do amazing thing in multiple filters simultaneously recording to different devices simultaneously. In fact, camera-wise, we there is no limit to what we can do. And yet, when they got to the moon, when Artemis got to the moon, 50 miles away, the footage was amazingly grainy, and there were no stars. When are we going to see stars in space? And if the general public is like, oh, well, there are no stars in space. And by the way, please, trolls, come back and tell me, well, there's just no stars in space. It's like, really? Because I go outside right now, and there's a whole bunch of stars. Tell me why the footage of me shooting the moon from here is better than a probe that's hovering 50 miles over the moon's surface. Unless, of course, the, it's not hovering over the moon's surface. <sighs> Okay, <laughs> to, the, to your second question, it's like, where are we? No, where, like where we live? What yeah, is this what place? is this earth? What do you, you think? are living? Uh, I'll, I'll use a, a thing I was typing in chat for uh, David Weiss's British interview that I was, I was watching earlier before this, which was uh, all the world's a stage. Shakespeare said that, and we are just players in it. That's flowery, but it's true. Now, I don't think that Shakespeare was a flat earther, but I think he kind of picked up on a few things, which was you are living in a building, uh, a giant soundstage with walls and a floor and a ceiling and apparently a big thing of water in the middle of it with some islands, which we call continents. And it has been manufactured. Uh, it, is, it is absolutely... It, if you want to go down the virtual reality path, that's fine. But since we're in it, it really doesn't matter. Because once you're in it, everything appears real. So we're not outside it. So I can only speak inside of it. Um, are we... Okay. If you're living in a, a, a building or a snow globe or a planetarium, and that's really what it is more than anything. I mean, it, it's a soundstage. But the ceiling, by the way, everything in the face. So everything down on the ground is pretty pretty rudimentary. 
Right, pretty basic. You got mountains and valleys and water and deserts and trees and crap like that. And because we can't fly, that's really what we're dealing with um, mostly. But the sky is exactly like what we do in video games. The, the sky is just a highly ornamental uh, clock system that predates language. That's all it is. And it's for signs and wonders and inspiration. And, you know, basically it's also a big clock. So people, you know, you can, back in the day, you don't even, get you don't even language. You can tell when to plant your crops and, and do other stuff just based on what was happening in the sky. Because back in the day, you had nothing better to do but to stare at the sky. And when everybody watched the scars curve overhead, yeah. they all drew the same thing. It's all, we're living in some sort of dome and the stars are on the inside. Well, that's how and they the can sun... create an antikythera mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Is... If you don't know what that is, anybody watching an Antikythera mechanism is a device. It's like they call it the first analog computer that you can wind and you can see all the the movements of the constellations and the sun and the moon right. and the you know the eclipses and they can yeah predict yeah. and everything with it. So yeah, so that's that's where we live. Um, the second question would be what what's outside of this place? Uh, I think there's more snow globes. There's more buildings outside of this. Why would it be a one-off? Uh, if whoever built this, again, whether it be an ancient civil, it definitely wasn't us, uh, an ancient civilization or some sort of divine power. But again, you're kind of splitting hairs because one man's div divine power is another man's high tech civilization. And if a golden spaceship landed in the middle of Chicago tomorrow, there'd be two schools of thought. There'd be two groups, separate groups of people. One would be like the science nerds. It's like, oh, wow, they do look like the blue people from Avatar, you know, and try to get selfies. And the other group would be like, we must worship the blue people and start building churches. It's how it's been with our, our history. But I also think there's rules. I don't think you're allowed to do that until the very end because it, it changes things forever. It's And I know I'm stealing a little bit from Star Trek, but it's true, right? Star Trek is like the prime directive. Don't screw up the timeline of whatever civilization is out there. I mean, the the la one of those later Star Trek movies where the ancient cultures saw the ship for all of 20 seconds and yeah. it changed their religion. They just threw out their old religion yeah. and they just started worshiping the, the spaceship <laughs> that, fl that flew off. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's what... Would it be that different now, even though mm -hmm. people would take selfies and do stuff? No, you'd have heavy religious people that would lean on it. So, and, and what's outside of the snow globes? Let's say there was a room, a room full of snow globes. What's outside of that place? Well, um, I'm a big believer in dualism, which is you can't enjoy one thing or appreciate one thing without its polar opposite. So pain without pleasure, light without shadow, um, hot without cold, and so on and so on. So if this world is 99.9% conflict, which it is, I mean, it doesn't matter how beautiful, how powerful, how talented, how, um, how rich you are, you always have something to complain about. And I think that's really interesting about this place. You can try to be any of these things or all these things, and still the richest people complain about stuff, and the most beautiful people complain, and so on and so on. Well, if that's the case, then whatever's outside of this world has to be the opposite, 99.9% .9 unlimited, which is you know a place that the time has no meaning. You know, not necessarily like a casino. I mean, like, you know, time really has no meaning. You you live forever. And you can do a lot of things. But like Einstein said, it doesn't matter if you believe in the math or not. Uh, he said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And I think that was cryptic. I got what he meant there. I think part of this universe is built off of novelty, which is why we're here, in my opinion, which is whoever built this wants us to act naturally. And we're not talking like fake natural, like a reality television show, right? Where the cameras or producers are walking around. You just don't see them, <laughs> see them in the show. We're talking like hidden cameras, reality show, which are completely illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, you want people because, again, every, human beings always act different when they're on camera. We've seen, that has never changed since cameras were invented. doesn't matter if it's a still shot or a news footage or whatever. When it, someone walks around with a freaking camera, if it's high end enough, people just do the goofiest stuff. They just act different. I mean, the smiles in their faces. Just It's like, yeah, I was there when his car blew up. Are we going to be on the air tonight? You know, it's like, it's like dude, you just watched somebody <laughs> burn to death. And, and so anyway, I think that's part of what, we, what we're at. We're, we're part of, you know, a show. The ultimate reality, uh, you know, thing. The uh, Truman you know, Show. The Truman Show. I mean, the Truman Show was <laughs> right. along those lines, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But it was only for one guy, which is why I expanded on it in the clues, which was, yeah. I said, look, it, what intrigued me was you could make that show basically as big as you want it, as long as the, 
you know you could control all the people walking around. It was very limited, and I know they did that for script purposes, but to only do it for one guy was kind of a waste. And in hindsight, you know, twenty something years later, uh, we realized that show wouldn't be able to be on the air for that long because yeah. people would have gotten bored. It's you know, it's, vo- it's voyeurism, <laughs> but that's about it. Anyway. What else yeah, you got? well, I mean, uh, the the Truman Show. There's a part where you know he's like, "I want to be an explorer," and they say, "There's nowhere left to explore, Truman." Right, <laughs> right. I mean, they they the the show was kind of cruel in that regard. Yeah. Right, where they they really roped him in, but again, it was for plot's sake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the show could have had a lot more people, which is why I kind of focused on the the M Night Shyamalan movie, The Village. That intrigued me more. Because the M. Night Shyamalan, the village where these kids were growing up in a fake town, you know, in the 1800s with no technology, what I thought was intriguing was when the parents and grandparents died, no one's lying. No one's acting. It's just the kids living the reality of how they're told. And, you know, you're told there's monsters in the woods, so they weren't going to be going and exploring. And think of how cheap they did that. But again, because and then you've got generations of people. How would that be different from where we are now? Yeah. Right? You you introduce a civilization, and I know we could go into how many times history has been reset. But well, from from a biblical perspective, which is normally where I come from, it's uh, you know in the beginning there was a garden, and it's like you want to be in the garden. That's the best place to be. Is the is the whole idea, right? Um, and and there's the um, the fruits and all good things available. That is freedom, and you could want to go to the outer outer edges and try to escape and transgress into heaven like Babylon, but that right. kind of backfired on them obviously that's not a good thing um in the eyes of of yeah and if the only way to pass through the waters is through death right and right and who knows what happens afterwards right is is kind of what you're saying right yeah. and, and and thank you for bringing that up the whole tower of babel thing which kind of clued me into you know it's it's one of the shortest stories in the bible but i and it's in genesis but i think it's so potent which is the first civilization that God built here was too perfect, too good at what they did. You know, they were unified and they were, uh, uh, you know, single language, single purpose. And worst of all, they knew where they figured out where they were. It's like, oh, yeah, we're in a structure. Let's build a bridge to the ceiling and let's get out of here. You know, let's go meet God. And again, the the line, you know, from God, it's like, you know, that he knew it was they were going to make it. It's like, ah, uh, crap. Yeah, they can accomplish whatever they yeah, put their mind yeah, to. Yeah. yeah, they're going to pull this off. Yeah. And so it's like, all right, we got to revise it. You know, the first reset, as it were. Yeah, they and divided I think, the and, languages and scattered them. Yeah. Yeah, and good. kill the tower and kill any any idea that you'd have about the tower. And I think that every civilization after that, and I'm sure there were others. I'm sure there's been refinements along the way. Uh, have been, I think there's been lots of efforts to slow everybody down, meaning slow down exploration, slow down human achievement. I mean, look look at this um, simple act of adding 3% salt solution to the, to the oceans, to where, and that was, that was damn clever, which was you make it to where you can't drink the water you're sailing on. Because both people don't remember back in the day, you only went as far as you had fresh water. And if you got to that halfway point, you had to decide if you could make it to your destination or you turn back because, you know, if you don't have fresh water, you're done. But if you could drink the water you were sailing on like a giant lake, <sighs> exploration is increased by 90 something percent because right, you could just keep going. We have a few questions in the chat. Okay. But, uh, the first one was by Yokana and the Seeker. Any upcoming Flat Earth meetups here in Washington State? Just uh i don't know if there is i generally don't orchestrate them myself i usually let i try to inspire others to what's the website that karen b runs what's it called uh flat earth festivals.com and it would be on there right it would be on there plus you can also again it's easy enough to do a meetup if you want to do a meetup and i've done a number in washington uh you know with other people just send me where you're gonna go where you, where you want to happen, and you know, I recommend a quiet sports bar or a coffee shop, something with a bigger room that we can kind of take over, and then I will make a promo on my channel. Karen will put on her thing, and if you make it, people will come. I Sweet. guarantee it. Next question April had was what, and this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, but yeah. what are uh, your thoughts on biblical cosmology? Are you approaching just on a science level, or what are your thoughts on Oh, no. Creation? I mean, if you were listening... 
yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, come on. I made a clue that literally expanded on the Tower of Babel, which was uh, very inspiring for me. I was raised uh, born-again evangelical. Uh, I fell away from the church when I got into tech for years, you know, because I played video games and became a video game producer for a number of years and then taught proprietary software. And as you know, if you're hanging out with super geeks and nerds, church isn't a thing. It's like, Sunday? No, man, we're gaming this Sunday. Yeah, and so I gamed pretty much every Sunday. Um, however, when I made the clues, I couldn't dodge the question of God very long. There were people all over the Christian community that were coming at me and says, you got to really address this. And so I literally made a clue called, they are hiding God. And apparently that resonated really, really well with people because the there were two channels that compiled the clues and they named them. One called it, they are hiding God with the greatest lie ever. And the other one called it, uh, they are hiding God with the biggest lie ever. And it was just the flat earth clues. And I never even talked to these guys. But uh, yeah, I mean, it. let's put it this way. We've had flat earth Christian conferences out there that have all told me the same thing, which is Flat Earth has become one of the fine, the greatest recruiting tools for the church in a long, long time. Because it takes people from, like, say, 92% to 98%. People that fell away from the church, there's like, oh, no, no, no. If, because if it's flat, if you're living in some sort of building, then it was built by someone. Right. Now, at that point, you've got to decide who that building is, but, and, and you know, is it God or did God subcontract the work? Either way, whoever built this is one step closer to knowing God's phone number than you are. So there you go. And by the way, I, I highly recommend whenever one ever says biblical cosmology, first thing I do is I recommend Rob Skiba's uh, testingtheglobe.com because it is the finest single website for biblical cosmology that I've ever seen. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can address a couple of these questions. Uh, Frank says, I have to correct uh, this falsehood, Antarctica at no time has ever been locked down or off limits. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> okay, well, the, you can look up. The, the PDF is not hard to find. Look up the Antarctic Treaty. The, the PDF is everywhere. There's been a ton of videos on it. I was the first one to bring it up, which is uh, Antarctica. Is Can you spend, let's say you're in America, can you spend 15,000 American and go down there and go on a raft and have your picture taken with some penguins and go along that little peninsula. Yes. Sure, you can. In fact, you can even go to the uh, mm. supposedly South Pole, even though it's magnetic, by the way, to look up what compasses do in the South Pole. They're absolutely worthless. There is no magnetic South. Everyone down there will tell you that, uh, which is so weird because, remember, it's supposed to be a bar magnet planet. Um, but the, other, the, the follow-up to that is you cannot roam freely. That's what the Antarctic Treaty is about. You try to organize any sort of exploration in Antarctica, I dare you. Try to go through the process. It will, Rob Skiba tried. He, lots he goes, of people he, have. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people have. There, the amount of money that you have to spend, uh, the amount of time and hoops you have to jump through are deliberate. In fact, there's money that you could spend this massive deposit that you don't even get back if you're refused. Yeah. It just screams, go away. So yes, Antarctica is locked down well they, again there's a reason they patrol it as well all the countries all who are part of the yeah. antarctic treaty over 60 yeah. now i think 60 yeah. countries yeah and, they patrol and tell the me border tell me why antarctica is the only continent or the only place in the world where the real estate is no owned by no one come on we fight over over, over property for centuries and yet antarctica everybody agrees it's like yeah nobody should ever own it it's like why 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 would you do that i mean and if it's resources then why isn't everybody down for resources? There's only 5,000 people down there at any given time. It's all military and military scientists. So yeah, yeah wh whatever. Yeah, not locked down. Do your research before you throw a question like that. Next. Um, how are you proposing... Oh, let's see. Rootool science. Yes, guys, you are going to have to reinvent all science. So one thing I would... I'll just recommend a channel. Wits It, Gets It would be the channel I'd recommend because they literally are um, debating astrophysicists and stuff. And if you want to yeah. learn about real science, not just um, pseudoscience, stuff that you're taught like... In, in school, then go, yeah. go to that Wits, channel. Yeah, awesome. is very good. One of the finest debaters I've ever seen. Uh, and um, and if you want uh, uh, some more flavor to it, go look up Nathan Oakley in Britain. 
He's been doing it for years. He was doing it for years before Witsit got into it. The only difference is is that he uses profanity when he tortures people. So Witsit holds back Nathan Oakley. It, it's for adults only. Yeah. Um, so last question that I want to okay. ask is your favorite proofs. For my it. favorite proofs i'll give you the you probably know them or maybe you don't i don't think i used them in the um in the speech in utah but we'll find out the i can't remember it to be honest the so there was a, a german television team that wanted me to debate a physicist from georgetown unfortunately because they know physicists when when you reach a phd in an academic level especially a physical science your um, powers of speech are just worthless i don't know what happens you just you go into this wheelhouse and it's just such tunnel vision which is why they put bill nye uh on um uh, on so many television shows because bill nye is an ex-actor from seattle i know this because he was on a local television show and i grew up watching him so i was they said come up with five five bullet points and we'll just record this and we'll give it to him and we'll just pass notes back and forth through class and, and hopefully you guys will be able to do something. But you guys are never going to talk to each other directly uh, because we, we don't want you talking over him. So uh, five real quick. Um, obvious, the one that gets into most people, uh, 80% of the Flyers community gets in because of long distance photography. Uh, the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile per mile, at least for the first 500 miles, which is way past the limit of most most photography anyway, so who cares? Um, which means that eventually things will be on the other side of the curve. But that's never the case. Uh, cameras can see boats, they can see lighthouses, they can see all sorts of stuff way, way further than they, they should, and really HD technology changed the game. 30 years ago, you could have a $3,000 camera on your shoulder, you wouldn't be able to see crap. Now you can get a $500 camera from walmart and you can see stuff that's amazing you know you can pull things back into frame that's usually what gets most people that's not my favorite uh my favorite is gravity versus the vacuum of space and i put this challenge out to anybody in fact i did for years which was uh tell me why like for example if you have a vacuum chamber above you right now and yeah. you, you have a valve and you pull that valve what happens it'll equalize instantly violently it's not like the movies the movies slow everything down for creative license and they will Second equalize in fact, you, may, you may black it it's it is a law of thermodynamics and that's not my law it's their law which is pressure cannot exist to non-pressure without some sort of physical barrier and so when you walk outside why is our atmosphere still here? Why has it not been sucked off into the vacuum of space? And you say, well, because of gravity. It has to be gravity, otherwise we'd be dead. And I go, you mean the same gravity that couldn't keep the air from rushing upstairs from your living room right now? That same exact va gravity? And, and again, the logic is, well, if it wasn't gravity, we'd be dead. And again, you're not thinking about it clearly enough. It's like, okay, so it's not a pressurized system, right? There's not a physical barrier there that could absolutely hold our atmosphere in. You're saying gravity is counteracting the vacuum of space. Again, the, the question I've thrown up for years out there, which is um, what happens at the bleeding edge of space? What happens when our atmosphere ends and space begins? Tell me exactly what happens there. Because thermodynamics says it cannot exist, uh, which is why I put the challenge out, oh, God, it's at least six years ago. I said, loan me any astronaut suit, right? Any astronaut. You can be completely supervised. Put me in a university vacuum chamber. Pull the switch. Tell me how I don't die. I was willing to put my life on the line. I still am. No one will touch it because, and again, with $4 worth of materials, because you can't trick me, and that's why it's never going to happen, is, you know, because you could put me in a vacuum chamber and pull the switch like, oh, you're in a vacuum. It's like, really? You know, and then all I have to do is hold up a bell and ring it. Now, if the bell rings, it's like, oh, it's not a vacuum, idiots. Right. You know, or, or, you know, tap water boils at room temperature in a vacuum and any, any pressurized thing, you know, just have a volleyball in with me. If it, it doesn't expand, well, you're screwed. Uh, fourth would be the, I'm um, sorry, that was the second one. Third one is um, uh, the eclipse shadow. The eclipse shadow is too small. Uh, the, the eclipse coming up, running from Texas all the way to Maine uh, on April 8th, for example. Lots of people are going to see it unless the weather sucks and then nobody's going to see it, which is uh, if the moon is 2,000 miles wide, why is the eclipse blackout zone, the circle, <laughs> you know, the black circle, it's only 70 miles wide? Wow, it's like a 95, 97% decrease. Why is it so small? And you say, well, it's convexing, blah, blah, blah. Well, it has nothing to do with the fact that we say that the moon is roughly 50 to 70 miles wide. It has nothing to do with that. Nope, 
which would, again, the shadow, when you walk by uh, any sort of building, your shadow, I don't care where you are, your shadow is always actual size or longer. It never shrinks to nothing. Your shadow never turns into an action figure, ever, ever. Uh, fourth one is the moon temperature, which I love so much. I didn't come up with it, which was, you know, that was literally a call-in and one of my a podcasts I did. And, and I, I laughed at him when he told me. He's going, the moon moon's cold. And I go, well, it's colder at night. What the hell are you talking about? Again, I've been flattered for at least a year, and I was laughing at him. And he goes, no, man, it's generating a cold light. I'm going, get out. And Rob Skiba heard this, too, and he was the one, one of the first people to, to test it. It's like, okay, if it's 80 degrees in the sun, it's 70 degrees in the shade. We all know it's cooler in the shade, always cooler in the shade, unless you're in the moonlight. Then it's, then it's warmer. Yeah. In fact, up to 13 degrees. Rob got a 13-degree swing. And, and you can test this with simple point-and-click $20 temperature guns that they use for engines and asphalt and stuff like that. And it's all shadows. It's not just some shadows. If yeah, it's all freaking shadows. It's, it's the, the moon is generating a cold yep. laser light. And you're yep. saying, well, and, and that's a real tech that we have. You can go on Amazon and type in cold laser light beauty products, and we have these all day long. And universities invented them decades ago. The question is, why is the moon generating a cold laser light? Does that prove that the Earth is flat? No, it does not. Have you heard any explanation for this from science? No, no, science won't touch touch it. it. In fact, I am stunned nobody's done a dissertation on this in the last nine years. It is is a freaking gold mine, although I'm sure they don't know what to do with it. Because seriously, if you try to do your PhD on that and make it, because that's a great original dissertation. Mm -hmm. Where do you go with this? Because it completely destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon. Yeah. Because, like, okay. Like, if you've been the to the moon... beach and the, the sun shines off the sand and it comes off cold, off the sand. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I mean, you're, you're, ta- you're saying that basically the, the moon is generating a refrigerant light. You know, and, and I was the first one to, to do this back in the day, right. which was because I, I, it's like, wait a minute. If you take a magnifying glass to sunlight, you can burn things, right? Mm-hmm. What happens if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight? It actually gets colder. Which is even weirder, which goes along with the whole cold laser light. It's like, all right, fine. Again, doesn't prove a flat earth, but it's weird. The moon's not, the moon's not reflecting the sun. Yeah. That's for sure. Which means they're self illuminating, which means they're, they're their own independent objects, which are roughly the same size. And last but not least, uh, my favorite, which is the Van Allen radiation belt trap question, which is uh, are the radiation belts deadly? And you're going to say, first off, you're going to say, yes, they are yeah. deadly. I go, oh, okay. So the Americans that took, what, six round trips to the moon and back, um, using plastic and aluminum as shielding, even though the only three things that can stop radiation are lead, gold, which is twice as uh, dense as uh, lead, and then a whole bunch of water, which they use for power plants. How did the Americans get through? Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody got cancer. There's still four of these guys limping around today, right? Nobody died from radiation poisoning. And you say, then you come back, you're going to flip. And you're going to say, well, no, they're not deadly. I go, really? Then look up Orion Trial by Fire, which is on the NASA's website. And they said, we don't know, we're not going to send capsules through the radiation belt yet because we haven't solved the radiation problem. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, watch <laughs> Artemis. Well, again, Artemis is going to be kicked down the road and won't matter. Uh, but I mean, how is Artemis going to resolve that? Because eventually, they're, remember, they, they've got crews. It's like, oh, no, we're going to go around the moon. It's like, how'd you solve the radiation problem? that NASA couldn't solve in 2014 when, again, the fact that NASA would even say that in 2014, we haven't solved the radiation problem. So what are you talking about? Yeah, the the Don Pettit. You know, we, we'd go back in a nanosecond. It's like, wait, you already solved this in the 1960s. It was perfect. In fact, you've never had a failure. You just needed tinfoil. No, yeah. That's all you need. No, <laughs> no, no astronaut has died in a suit other than, you know, Challenger and Columbia, but that's completely unrelated, right? Nobody has ever, like, walked out, you know, on a spacewalk and died. And why, why do you keep changing suits? Every suit that you make is perfectly fine. It's got a 100% track record except for the one that you supposedly drowned in, which has nothing to do with the underwater pool that you're training in and passing off as the real thing. Anyway, so those five questions we threw at the uh, um, the physicist from Georgetown, and that was it. He just folded like a card table. That was it. It's like, nope, I'm not doing this. I'm out. And the Germans went away upset. However, in the physicist defense, the reason why he folded was that when you reach a PhD level in your particular field, you are not comfortable asking any question that's outside your wheelhouse. Now, he may be able to ask the Van Allen thing and he might be able to ask gravity versus the vacuum of space but he can't touch long distance photography that's not his field he can't talk to, touch the moon shadow probably because it's not his field he's definitely not going to touch the moon temperature because he isn't even what the hell that is yeah 
so yeah, that's those are my five that I throw out there, and and I I can't remember the last I can't remember what year I got an, an email based on those five questions. Or you know what? Again, trolls that are listening, you want to solve it for me? All you have to do is answer one question. Ready? Here we go. How does the spacesuit stop the astronauts from dying? <laughs> right? Don't tell me. And I made a clue on this. It was called for want of a nail, which was. Don't tell me about heating or cooling or oxygen and, and carbon dioxide or any of that crap. Tell me how a vacuum doesn't rip that suit to shreds. Right. And which is why I made the, the, the want of a nail. Because if the suit doesn't work, then anything that ever showed the suit is a lie. That's it. Or, or while just real quick on a side note, why did the early NASA suits they tested in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, why were they all plastic and metal when they first started out? Because that's the only thing that Eden had a chance in a vacuum. And then they switched to a soft suit, and that was brilliant. Whoever, whoever did that, kudos to you. I hope you died rich and happy <laughs> because... That was brilliant. All they had to do, and I will, we'll end kind of with this, but I, if you have a follow-up, that's fine, which is uh, all you had to do was show the guy in a space suit, right? Put it on TV, and because the average person doesn't take any physics classes or any decent math, they didn't know. It's like, oh, it works. I have asked, I don't know how many people outside of America, right? America, of course, we're required to believe in moon, the moon mission. It's, it's part of our thing, right? It's Patriotism patriotism yeah. even if you don't believe it it's like wave the flag america's the greatest yeah our flag's on hey, the moon oh, I, love, I, <laughs> I love this country however i ask people like i'll just use throw sweden out there i love using them you know i big swedish audience it's like why do you guys think the americans went to the moon everybody says the same thing it's like well uh because you put it on television and your news would never lie about anything like that Nah. And and I, I, I smile and I go, man, you guys don't know us at all. Definitely <laughs> we, not during wartime. We would never lie. About no, we do not. Like no, we'd never <laughs> lie. We, we come on the Americans. Any if we can get away with a lie, the American government will do it. If it makes us look better, we're doing it. And it worked. Oh, yeah. Everybody were, you know, we broadcast the moon missions everywhere and everybody watched. It's like, again, I get it in the in the 1960s. By 1969, we were bulletproof. After World War II, we were the last hope of the world. And everyone, and so we went for it. And, so, and everyone's like, yeah, America, they'll lead us out of this darkness. And it's like, okay. Yeah, because we're not going to take advantage of that. Uh, right. No. Anyway, there I'll, you go. I'll add, I'll add one more to your list, maybe. Okay. Whales can, can speak to each other like 3,000 miles away. And sure. you know how much curvature. <laughs> like That's a crazy ton amount of curvature there you go that and what happens is there's a, there's an acoustic shadow with with uh with um sonar so right. it can't go through rocks it can't go through curvature it doesn't curve either right Audio that's good i hadn't curve. heard that one and so I, I was listening to this um submarine captain talk about how in you could basically just hide on the bottom of the ocean if you never wanted to be detected. And that's what they do anyways, but you would just hide behind the curve basically. And you would never ever be detected But he's saying that's not the case. And what actually happens is what, what whales use is they use a so far channel. So there's a specific depth in the ocean that you yeah. can literally just like freaking shoot uh, audio through <laughs> and it, it'll go it'll travel thousands and thousands and thousands of miles to your wow. destination it's crazy so well yeah and again because you're going through a medium uh of water which is very conducive especially to sound yes, you know which at a specific depth there's a so yeah. far channel and so it's really interesting yeah. so i, I mean so again how depth charges work you know it's yeah. it's a media a medium explosive but the but the uh, I'm sorry. It's a low yield explosive, but the medium of water is so dense that it creates a, it amplifies the shock wave. Right. Uh, compare that real fast to um, transmitting from the moon. Right. How did Apollo transmit <laughs> ten frames of color video a second and perfect two way communication from the moon? It didn't. It had a with what power source? It was running off a car battery. You can look this up. This is not classified. It was running a standard VHF transmitter that had maybe a range of 50 miles and that's morse code 
right? 1969, we had our technology was awful. And you're saying, okay, well, it, it went up to the geostationary capsule thing, and that went 250,000 miles. It's like through what? Yeah. Through the vacuum of space and then through the Van Allen radiation belts with no distortion? And they're talking and, with no delay either? Yeah, with no delay. <laughs> oh, yeah, those mistakes are horrible, by the way. Uh, yeah. Absolutely horrible. But again, the average person... They, you know, I'll, let's end it with this. The the Truman Show line has never changed, which is, we believe the world that is presented to us, because why we we don't naturally believe that people in authority would ever lie, but the the truth is, at a certain level, the the people in authority lie for what they consider to be the greater good, and they do it every single time, yeah, because it's for the greater good. It's like, look, if we have to lie, we're gonna lie, so we're going to, and I think that's by the way, it's how they'll get out of it in the end. Which is, if you really you want to let an ass off the hook, by the way, think tanks, if you're listening to this, I you've heard me say it. All you have to do is create a fake alien race or a real alien race, whatever. Whatever this ancient civilization, and then just blame it on them. Have them say, oh, it's not NASA's fault. We made them do it right. for your own safety. <laughs> right? That's it. That's all you have to do. And, be, and most people would be like, oh, well, okay then. All right. People forget okay. quick, so it'll be fine. Uh, yeah. Well, awesome. It was uh, awesome to speak to you, Mark. Sorry about all yeah. the technical difficulties. Oh, no, 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 no. No worries at all. I mean, I think you were recording most of it. So, um, I'm recording all of it. Spli so, splice yeah. me or send me what you can. Yep. And uh, I'll, I'll do what I can with it. But uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it was awesome. It was a pleasure for me. And uh, yeah, th thank you so much for coming on the channel. Again, go follow yep. uh, Mark on his channel if you're watching this uh, afterwards on my channel. Uh, the His channel's linked in the description of this video. And cool. yeah, uh, go to the meetups, talk to him in person. He's very easy to talk to, obviously. So I try. Yeah, he tries. And yeah, uh, till next time. Thank you, everybody, for watching um, this stream. And sorry if we didn't address everyone's questions. We got a, a few comments that we didn't address, but that's all right. They can always email me. Yeah, or you. Yeah, you've doxed yourself, and uh, my have. email is also on my YouTube, so you can email me whenever. Anyhow, cool. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. We'll see Thanks. you around. All right. See ya.